Good morning, everyone. Um, here with an amazing group of people who are doing everything in cell and gene therapy from cancer to stem cells. Um, and I thought we would just start with a couple questions. And as, uh, as we get started, I'd like you to introduce yourselves and just say a little bit about what your, your company is basically working on as, as its main thing. Um, um, so immediately to my left, we have um, Chris Coughlin. Um, and Chris, why don't you tell us a little bit about you and also about what your company is doing. Great, so I'm the CEO uh, of Cytoimmune Therapeutics. We are an engineered NK cell company uh, focused on both solid tumors as well as, as hematologic malignancies and, and really using the NK cell um, and its biology um, to, to turn on an effective anti-tumor immune response. So Chris, uh, my immediate follow-up question for you is, you've been a T-cell person for a very long time. You and I go back to kindergarten, as we say. <laughs> um, why the switch to NK cells, and what is that about? Sure. So uh, Marcella and I um, hail from uh, Carl June's lab together, where we were both uh, trainees a long, a long time ago. <laughs> kindergarten, because we're, we're actually not that old. Um, but I started in, in biotech uh, with Carl at Team Unity, um, and that was autologous CAR T cells, um, looking again at solid tumors. Moved over to engineered red cells uh, with Rubius, and, and now um, with Cytoimmune uh, with Mike Caligiuri, um, looking at the NK cell. And so the T cells and the NK cells really work together in any effective immune response, and it's important um, to really think about getting both of them going. Um, I think about it almost as, as three first principles as we're going to get the NK cell working, um, and, and we think a lot about solid tumors. So first biologic principle is how do these cells recognize tumors or, or viruses, um, which is exactly what the NK cell is, is tasked to do within the immune system. And so T cells are, are fairly simple beasts. They recognize antigen, and there's you know, a long history of, of understanding of that. NK cells and innate cells really recognize patterns, and they recognize patterns of, of cellular stress. And so an NK cell within the immune system, within the, the natural biology, is tasked with recognizing, interacting with tissues and recognizing either a, a, a virally infected cell or a transformed cell on its way to becoming a tumor. And what we've really identified over the last two years or so is that the NK cell that is built by the bone marrow to hunt viruses and hunt tumors, those are two different NK cells. And the bone marrow actually makes them. They have different trafficking patterns. They have different abilities to kill. We call the, the tumor ones, the tumor reactive NK cells. Anecdote about these cells is we all have them. They're all in our, our um, you know, circulating in our, our bloodstream. The people that don't have them, though, are late-stage cancer patients because they're gone. They're actually turned off, and their absence is correlated with, with a negative prognosis. So we, we know that these cells are important in the progression of cancer. Second first principle of biology um, is the timing, and really getting these cells, the T cells and the NK cells, to work together. T cells and NK cells, they're both cytotoxic lymphocytes, but, but that's really where the family resemblance ends um, between them. The NK cells are the first soldiers on the field. Um, the, the innate system comes in first, whether it's an infection um, or a tumor. And the job of the NK cell, the two jobs, um, again, simple beast, they have two things to do. The first is they get the killing started, but the second thing is, is they call in the T cells in the adaptive um, system, the adaptive immune response. T cells don't normally interact with tissues. They don't home to the breast, the lung. Um, that's the job of, of the NK cells. And the NK cells are designed to bring in the T cells. Those first two principles, targeting and um, the timing of the response, those are NK intrinsic. I think of those things as, you know, we can manufacture them in, we can engineer them in. The third first principle, though, um, is NK extrinsic. And that's, we've, we've heard that on the stage here from, um, you know, David Scadden, Ned Sharpless, Carl June yesterday. And that's, that's this concept of the tumor microenvironment. If we're going to get cell therapy to work in solid tumors, we're going to have to deal with resistance. 
And the main mechanism of resistance there is, is this immunosuppressed tumor microenvironment. In those intrinsic factors, we can get the NK cells and the T cells to traffic to the tumor microenvironment. We can engineer that in. But once they get there, and, and Tony Rebos and Paul Tomei published this back in, in 2014 in Science, the, the T cells, the NK cells, they almost sit in the tumor stroma interface. We've got to get them to infiltrate. And that's where we build in clinical trial design, and we're going to need to take forward quickly, we think, in the first in human trials, um, those measures um, or combination therapies that are going to overcome um, the tumor microenvironment, flip it, essentially, from immune suppressive to immune permissive, allowing the effector cells um, to get in. And there we think about things like reprogramming um, the myeloid, reprogramming macrophages, um, flipping the metabolism, um, you know, cytokine milieu. But those are, those are important factors, um, but they're extrinsic to our effector cells. And so building those combination therapies, I think, are going to be really important um, as we move forward. So, you know, three first principles um, that we think about, targeting and, and staying true to the biology of the cells, the timing and really getting the T cells and the NK cells going at the same time. That's where we've seen responses um, in solid tumors. And then finally, that third principle um, is, is really flipping the tumor microenvironment and allowing the cells, um, the effector cells, um, to penetrate those solid tumors. Thanks, Chris. It sounds like exciting, and I'm glad that part of the job of the NK cells is to, to bring in the T cells as a bona fide T cell centric biologist. I'm still a T cell girl at heart, <laughs> um, but yeah, flipped over to the NK side. But it sounds like we do need that orchestra, so I'm, I'm really Thank excited you. about that. Um, Nick, I wondered if um, you could talk to us a little bit about 270, and you're pursuing the autologous, uh, autologous T cell, and you've also sort of separated from the gene therapy, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about both of those things. Yeah, thank you, Marcel, and thanks for uh, being here. It's also good to see the younger generation coming in, at least I hope it's the younger generation, or we're all really old uh, sitting up here. <laughs> Um, yeah, we didn't feel our lawyers were making enough money, so we decided to split uh, the company, which has been a year-long exercise, and it's, it was a company called Bluebird Bio. We now split into two. One is Bluebird, but focused on severe genetic diseases using autologous uh, gene therapy. Same time, we've been developing on the, on the oncology side using a similar platform for the cancer side. And, you know, long story short, we're sort of the youngest, oldest company, I think. We're 180 days old, but we've been at it for 13 years. Um, but the idea here was to say we have a product in a BECMA, which is a, a targeted car for BCMA and myeloma, that is out there doing hopefully uh, some really good work for myeloma patients in collaboration with, with BMS. But it's sort of just the beginning. I think part of what I think is the take home probably from all of us up here is most of us don't really know what we're talking about. And, and the reason why I'm saying that is it's just the beginning, right? We're still guessing, and it, but it's amazingly powerful how it, all these ideas up here, in my opinion, is an and, right? So 270 is now saying we're going to try to focus in on deep autologous therapy. We believe it works, and we believe we can make it better, and we believe we can make it better by layering technologies together from all walks of life in different ways, and then trying to partner with others, other cell types and others to, to attack cancer in a more fundamental way. So I'm a big believer in and. I know the media and Wall Street doesn't like ands. They like or because they like drama. Uh, but, you know, cancer doesn't give a crap, right? We want, we got to get after it in a, in a big kind of and way. So that we split the company, say, really dig deep into autologous therapy, make as angry a T cell as you possibly can, and then think about how that then starts to partner with cancer and with other ideas. And that's what we've been up to at 270, and that needed focus, that needed to split the company away, and that's uh, what we're up to these days. And that's, uh, there's a lot of culture and people stuff that's embedded in everything we do. Uh, for all of us, frankly, uh, is at the end of the day probably the most important thing if you want to have sustained, thoughtful innovation um, is that you kind of get grounded in that way. So that was the split side, and now we're off to the races going after some what we think pretty fundamentally layered technologies that can uh, attack cancer in a, in, a, in a deeper way, hopefully. <clears throat> it's, it's great. Um, really exciting. And I always think it's interesting that gene and cell therapy are often lumped together even in this kind of forum, um, but that as the field starts to mature, that there may be advantages to kind of separating them out in some well, ways. Well, there, there clearly is. I mean, it's, a, we, it's all gene therapy, but I think it's sort of the approach you maybe take and sort of uh, 
a, a T cell certainly has very different characteristics and we like to say you can kind of hit a T cell on the head and it, it still will keep working. A stem cell on our stem cell side of the equation is a much more complicated manufacturing and sensitive beast in the sense it has to sort of you have to be very careful in order to get the advantages of it that you want. And so that is also part of the business is how do you sort of allow the infrastructure in the back office to do what it needs to do. And frankly, we're spending too much time just firefighting on one side of the business and not digging deep and stepping back and getting a little more innovative on the other. And that sub-optimizing and that hurt where we feel is most important, which is the mission, right? And what we're trying to do here is bigger than any one of us. And so what's the best way to do it? And it was a painful lawyerly blah, blah, blah for the last year and a half. And you focus on things you don't want to spend your life doing. But hopefully now we have some escape velocity. I'm pretty excited to be back to kind of just talking to really smart people. That's great. Um, Rusty, you're working on B cells, so different arm of the immune system. Tell us a little bit about um, what you're doing and uh, how you think B cells are the answer. Uh, yes, sure. Um, I'm uh, the CEO and uh, co-founder of Walking Fish Therapeutics. Um, Walking fish refers to the, is a colloquial term for a Mexican salamander called axolotl that inspires us because of its regenerative capacity. Um, and prior to this, I was the founder and CEO of Biprime Therapeutics, an immuno-oncology company. It was sold to Amgen last year. Um, I feel like I'm coming home uh, because I did uh, all of my clinical training at Mass General Hospital and was on the faculty here, but that was a uh, long time ago. Um, so at uh, Walking Fish, we use B cells as therapies. B cells obtained from peripheral blood. And uh, we use B cells uh, for what they do best. And the two things that they do uh, very well, that they're, they're known for, one is um, they make a lot of antibody, they make a lot of protein, especially when they're differentiated towards plasma cells. So they can be protein factories, if you will. So we use them for that application. Secondly, we use them uh, in oncology and infectious disease because they're great antigen-presenting cells. And, and in our book, they're the best antigen-presenting cells you can obtain from the peripheral blood. Um, so we use them in these two um, aspects. And so our company works on two very different types of projects. The protein factory side, we, as I said, we take peripheral blood, engineer the blood to express uh, one or more proteins um, that can be um, active systemically. And we differentiate the cells ex vivo to be more like plasma cells. And plasma cells have very long half-lives in your body. And we re-administer the cells. Uh, and then these protein factories fi find their niches and continuously at a steady state level produce a protein of interest. For example, factor eight um, in uh, hemophilia, this kind of uh, application. Uh, you could engineer B cells to produce a recombinant antibody or several recombinant antibodies um, for infectious disease or for other diseases as well. Of course, they're good at making antibodies. In oncology, we engineer B cells to home to tumors, but it's very different from uh, T cell therapy, because B cells aren't directly cytotoxic, but they're really good at presenting antigens. So the T cells, once they get to the tumor, we've engineered CARs. They're very different chimeric antigen receptors. They're very different from the CARs in T cells. Um, they recognize antigen. Uh, the B cell engulfs uh, pieces of the plasma membrane and presents antigen uh, on MHC and triggers an immune response. And so that's the way we um, use them in cancer. Really interesting. I'm wondering if, uh, diving just a little bit deep into this, deeper into the science, if you don't mind, are there some proteins that B cells make better than others besides antibodies in terms of glycosylation or you know, post-translational modifications? Does that, does that yeah, that's a good question and one that we wondered about at the beginning. Um, to date, the the proteins we've expressed in B cells, uh, <clears throat> we've been pleasantly surprised that these proteins are processed um, correctly with uh, post-translational modifications. For example, there are some, um, for lysosomal storage diseases, proteins have to be 
uh, have meno 6 phosphate on them, and B cells are able to do that. Uh, we thought we were going to have to do some fancy engineering to, to do that for those proteins, but we can express um, those types of proteins that are currently given as recombinant protein therapies, maybe every two weeks for the life of the patient, $300,000 a year. And so we, if you could get a B cell partially differentiated to do the same thing with a one-time treatment, maybe every year or two, or uh, hopefully with an even longer duration, that would be preferable. So we, we found we can make antibodies, of course, but we can also make uh, other types of proteins. Um, capitalizing on the endoplasmic reticulum and the protein production machinery that uh, these cells are known uh, to have. It's great, really interesting, really exciting. Um, Rachel, um, Caribou is a gene editing company. Um, tell us a little bit about your interest in the gene editing and also whether you're going for allogeneic um, products and, and how you think about that. Yeah, absolutely. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rachel Harwitz, and I'm the president and CEO of Caribou Bio and one of its co-founders. You're right, we're a CRISPR genome editing company spun out of Jennifer Doudna's lab about a decade ago. We've actually invented our own next generation CRISPR technology that is significantly more specific than first generation CRISPR-Cas9. One of the reasons we were really focused on specificity for quite some time is that as we look at the cell therapy setting, we understand that cancer is not a simple disease and quite sophisticated cell therapies are going to be necessary to have the appropriate anti-tumor activity. And so as we think about the multiplicity of genome edits necessary to achieve that, we really need to be able to do that with high efficiency while maintaining genomic integrity. So at Caribou, our focus today is to use this technology to develop allogeneic or, or off-the-shelf CAR-Ts, uh, as well as allogeneic CAR-NKs. Uh, we very much agree with, with a lot of what Chris mentioned as we think about the challenges of solid tumors. Um, and clearly, the evidence thus far from the clinic that CAR-Ts are, are probably not going to be the easy win. So we agree that uh, natural killer cells have inherent biology that makes them very attractive. And we see that as an important start point. And from there, we can start layering on a number of different genome edits to address so many of the challenges inherent in targeting solid tumors. To actually stitch all of that into the cell therapy itself, we actually start with iPSCs. At the iPSC stage is where we can do a multiplicity of genome edits, pick out a single cell clone that has everything we're looking for, and then differentiate that into natural killer cells with anti-tumor potential. On the allocar T side, we instead start our manufacturing with healthy donor leukapheresis. And here we're able to implement a multiplicity of genome edits. And one of the key themes that we focus on for both our allocar T's and our allocar NK's is persistence. Um, and maybe starting specifically with the allocar T's, the reason we think so much about persistence is because, of course, if we think about a healthy donor T cell and adding a CAR and providing that to a patient, that's of course foreign to the patient's immune system. And we understand will be immune rejected fairly rapidly. So it's that understanding that really sets us uh, on this path to focus on using our genome editing to enhance persistence. We actually do it in a variety of ways. Uh, for example, our LEAD program, which is in an ongoing phase one study, and we'll be sharing initial clinical data in June targeting CD19, we actually knock out PD-1, which I'm sure is a protein very familiar to this audience. And the purpose, of course, is to prevent premature CAR-T exhaustion in order to maintain these CAR-Ts in a high anti-tumor activity state for a longer period of time. And what we've seen in our preclinical data is that the PD-1 knockout leads to a profound increase in overall survival. Of course, this is not the only way to think about persistence. A second strategy that we're using for our multiple myeloma program, for which we'll be filing an IND this year, we're instead actually immune cloaking the CAR-Ts to head on combat this rapid rejection by the patient's immune system. We do so through a couple of different genome edits. We get rid of all of the endogenous class one presentation, and then we further engineer the cells so that they only present HLA-E, one of the minor antigens on their surface. And our aim is to prevent both the patient's T cells and the patient's natural killer cells from rapidly rejecting the therapy. These are two examples. Uh, clearly, there are many more being uh, developed by others as well as in our group as we think about ways to continue armoring these cells so that an off-the-shelf strategy can meaningfully compete with the response rates that we've seen from auto CAR-Ts to date while being available to a much broader patient population. Great. 
Thank you. Um, Davina, you're also interested in allogeneics and off the shelves. Tell us a little bit about your approach and, and why you think it's going to be great. Sure. So I'm Dvanit Shah. I'm the, uh, co-founder, president, and CEO of Gerda Therapeutics. We are developing off-the-shelf hematopoietic stem cells from human iPSCs with aim to eliminate need to find bone marrow donor from the planet Earth and potentially cure 70 plus diseases. Uh, this technology was born out of my former research lab at Brigham and Women's Hospital. So like Rust, it's also homecoming for me. Uh, I think there is a lot of buzz around allogenic and autologous cell therapy nowadays, but I would like to take everyone back to 50 years ago in 1951 when the first ever cell therapy was discovered, something called bone marrow transplant, aka hematopoietic stem cell transplant. And over the last 50 plus years, we have learned across million successful transplants that uh, any cell therapy presents three major challenges. And, and we have learned a lot out of that. First among them is how we prep the patient, how we modify cells and inject into a patient, and then how we manage and monitor the patient. I'm not going to waste, uh, you know, spend a lot of time in prepping and managing patient right now, but when it comes to modifying cells, we all learn there are five major issues, whether it's allogenic or autologous, consistency between two different products going into patient, uh, safety of the cell, whether it's off-target editing or beyond, uh, stability, uh, I would say, uh, durability of cell, uh, scalability of cell, and most importantly, COX. Uh, we might produce a product, uh, you know, a fancy product, but uh, there may not be buyers for it or payers for available to pay the, what and it cost us to produce. So if you put everything together, uh, one thing was uh, pretty much clear to us was if we do not produce something which meets all this criteria and, uh, you know, then that product would not have any future to it. So when we were able to discover how to make human engraftable transgene free, hematopoietic stem cells from human iPSCs, it was just obvious for us that this is the holy grail in medicine we should go after. And hopefully it's simple uh, approach where we just convert iPSCs into transgene-free hematopoietic stem cell and just take it to patients and hopefully meet all those bars, uh, which you know, uh, rightfully so FD has put out for us. And that's what kind of driving us to hopefully uh, deliver off-the-shelf hematopoietic stem cells to millions of patients globally out there. Well, very am ambitious, and uh, I'm wondering, are you also thinking about regenerative medicine then beyond? We are. Uh, I think the way we think right now is we have a vanilla products pipeline, which would let alone cure 70 plus diseases. Then we would go after gene-empowered hematopoietic stem cell, and we can do so because we can perform uh, very specific uh, stable editing at the iPSC stage, and then differentiate them into empowered hematopoietic stem cell down the line. And we can also use our off-the-shelf hematopoietic stem cells to develop functional, durable, NK cell, T cell, B cell, platelets, red cells, and beyond. As, you know, as Rachel pointed out, uh, there is a you know, challenge in a field that we can make T cells, but they're on engraft in thymus. We can make NK cells, but they are not durable long enough. And if you don't do that, then the product wouldn't have you know, issues around relapse or so. So we are thinking um, across the spectrum, but one step at a time. We've got to focus. That makes sense. Rusty, do, I, I know you're also interested in regenerative medicine. Do you want to add to that? And um, sure. Um, <clears throat> so we, uh, one of our projects is to uh, engineer B cells. So I mentioned the protein factory idea that B cells can produce proteins. Um, and we're f fusing two different ideas. One is the idea that the B cell can be a protein factory with the idea that we can home B cells to specific tissues. And so our long-term goal with that is to be able to home a B cell to a disease tissue and deliver um, uh, in our, uh, in our uh, expectations and our hopes several factors um, to that disease tissue locally, thereby increasing the therapeutic index and so um, in that sense, we are working on regenerative medicine in a number of fields, um, including <coughs> my original field, which is a cardiovascular medicine um, uh, after myocardial infarction. So that, that's, a, that's a second generation of product for us, this homing the B cell factory to a tissue. The first generation of product on the protein factory side is systemic levels of protein. 
Um, Chris, uh, NavNet sort of got into a little bit of uh, access, which I, patient access, which I know has also been uh, something that you're very interested in. Do you want to tell us your thoughts a little bit about how do we go beyond mice and wealthy patients? <laughs> so um, I think it's really important in cell therapy. Um, necessity is, is sort of the mother of invention. Um, when I was, it would, we go back in time uh, to February, March of, of 2020, I was actually the chief medical officer at, at Rubius, and we started to see the academic medical centers where we were delivering ourselves and, and trying to get the trials open go down um, essentially to, to clinical research. They weren't opening new studies as, as they were dealing with, um, with the pandemic. And so to keep momentum, uh, we had to start to, to think creatively. And it turns out that the centers that were not going down were the community centers, or we called them oncology only, um, private practices. And so we started phoning friends and, and asking, you know, can you, can you open this um, cell therapy trial for us? And at first the answer was, well, we don't have a, a cell lab. We don't really do cells here. And so we started to think hard. And when you, th when you think about it, 80% of cancer patients, so four out of five cancer patients are treated in the community setting. Only 20% are treated in the larger academic medical centers where, generally speaking, we, we put all of our cell therapy trials. And so in order to get cells into the community, into private practice, that was going to be enabled, we found, by essentially two things. The first is the, the presentation of the cells. So we couldn't deliver a frozen bag of cells to a pharmacy. That's not how they operate. So we started putting our cells at that point into the same presentation that a monoclonal antibody would come, which would be in vials. So now we, we package our cells in vials. Pharmacists are, are perfectly able of, of thawing the vial, um, drawing it up, and, and putting it um, for the patient. We had to have the freezing media, though, that can be then um, infused directly into a patient to minimize what has to be done in the pharmacy. We had to keep to FACT standards, JC standards, and develop all of the processes by which we get the cells um, into the pharmacy. The second thing that enables cells to move into um, the community setting is, is really the therapeutic index. And that goes back to also my third first principle, which is the, the combination therapy. Um, that's enabled by the safety profile that we see um, with some of the cells that, that many of us work here. You know, the CAR NK cells are, are thought to have, at least the early days, look like they're going to have um, somewhat of a more favorable therapeutic index, favorable safety profile. And so the bed that the patient um, lays in to get their cells doesn't need to be linked directly to an ICU. And so, you know, even during the pandemic, again, when I was at Rubius, we enrolled more than 50 patients into, you know, multiple phase ones. Most of our enrollment um, came from these community centers, and it was really figuring this out. And if we can do that, we're really going to fix this access problem. Um, right now, we hear from physicians, from even from patients, that you know these these novel cell therapies. We hear about these 10-year cures, and patients are really seeking these, but they don't always want to go downtown, and and sometimes they can't um, make their way downtown um, for as frequently. You know, we redose our NK cells. Um, NK cells have a very short lifespan. Um, these lymphocytes only last for weeks to months, and so we're going to need to redose. Um, that coming down to the academic medical center every week for, um, for therapy, for the, you know, the, the assessments that we have to do, that's hard on patients, whereas if it's the community center, um, that, that's easier for them. The other benefit that we're going to see as we're enrolling our, our trials is Honestly, first, second line therapy is often given in the community setting before the patient makes their way to the academic center. So the extra added benefit that we're going to see are patients, especially in phase one, in these earlier lines of therapy. And, and we found that um, in spades. It, it really helped the clinical development, um, but it really helps the patient. So it's win-win. It's not easy. Um, there's a lot of things that you have to do, presentation, trainings, um, and whatnot. But 
Moving cell therapy into the community setting, I, I think, is really going to be important for access for patients. Interesting. Rachel, I'm, I'm curious, you know, one of the uh, benefits that people talk about are the motivations for allogeneic cell therapy is, uh, is more access and, and off the shelf. Do you, do you think that that's going to become uh, a reality? And, and what are some of the challenges associated with that? Yeah, it's a, a really important question. I, I think the allogeneic approach solves a different element of access, and it's really sort of a, the scientific or technology component, right? Uh, for patients who have access to auto CAR Ts for especially CD19 or, or BCMA positive diseases today, the outcomes can be transformative, right? It is an extraordinary demonstration of the power of the immune system, specifically the power of the T cell to fight cancer. But unfortunately, we also know that a meaningful fraction of patients will never be able to access auto CAR Ts for a wide variety of reasons, ranging anywhere from they're simply too sick to wait for their product to be manufactured through to they've received years of genotoxic and cytotoxic materials to try to treat their cancer. They no longer have T cells left with enough of a punch to actually deliver a therapeutic benefit. So as we think about the broader patient population, I certainly agree that an allogeneic approach, starting instead with healthy donor uh, material to create an off-the-shelf product, um, could really broaden the number of patients who have access to this. Uh, of course, where patients have access is another really important point, and, and Chris, I, I'm so pleased that you addressed that. Um, Nick, you have on-the-ground experience with patient access and uh, a pipeline of new autologous uh, therapies. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've learned and what the th through that process and and how autologous um, may be optimized to improve access? Yeah, it's it's in one breath, it's super exciting and, and energizing, right? To have a medicine that's out there and then to validate one thing at least, which people were questioning is, is there an opportunity? Will people care? Do people will physicians use it? Will institutions and payers support it? Et cetera. And that's universally been sort of through CD19 and now through BCMA proven as absolutely. However, Rachel's absolutely correct, right? It's not, it's not at the scale right now where the most painful thing is know that there's a line out the door with folks who aren't a able to access. And I can't imagine knowing that the science and the medicine's there, but you're sitting there with myeloma, you're like, dang it, like, why can't I get onto it? That is a, a horrifying wake up every night kind of thing for, for me personally and for everyone involved. At the same time, this is a journey. Right. This is a good step in the right direction, and even in the last six to 12 months, the scale and the improvement on making the vector as well as deploying the autog has gone sort of in a, in a very steep rise and will continue. However, it needs improvement. It probably needs in, in ways where you engineer the manufacturing process to be more in the lines with one, two, three days in that, in that regard. But also, this was medicines that were made six, seven years ago. I think people have a tendency to sort of forget that. The process takes a little bit of time. So the manufacturing improvements since then uh, for auto, for allo, for every sort of type of cell out there has dramatically improved. So if you zoom out and forget about any one of our individual companies, I think one could believe that in three, four, five years, right, we're all going to have access to an ability to do this better with better access. The question is, what's the right combination for the right patient for the right setting? That's what I think is a bit of the holy grail, and that comes back to what we've been focused on and I think many, not just us, but we all do it in our different ways, which is how do you ask and answer really thoughtful scientific questions as fast as you can in human beings? And so there's another element to this, which is not just scale and manufacturing, it's the regulatory dialogue. It is the ability to say, I wanna go after one disease and these biological problems, but I'm not smart enough to know if it's an NK cell or if it's an edit of this type or it's a car of this dual nature or what a, I wanna be able to ask six questions at the same time in the same clinical study Right, we're sort of moving it forward. So in that sense, I can then say, okay, for my next the suite of 20 patients, I'm gonna go to three of those constructs because they taught me something. And by the way, I'm now gonna move in sort of the next concept into either it's a manufacturing change or it's a, an extrinsic combination that plays into it. The problem with that mindset is one, you need to be able to manufacture that many constructs. You need to be able to make them work together at that kind of sort of intracellular as well as sort of combination externally <coughs> together. You need the regulators to be able to say, yep, I give you the clinical flexibility and the manufacturing flexibility to do just that. I'm thoroughly convinced it will happen, and it will happen in the next few years, and that is where I think we now will start to take all of our technologies and really figure out how they're going to work well together. 
Because at the end of the day, nobody really cares where the innovation comes from. Ultimately, the physicians are going to say, I want that, I want that together, and now we're talking for this patient population early, hopefully, right? The more patients we can treat earlier. And so certainly aloe in that regard, I think, has a amazing potential. You still need to know what to put in, right, in that aloe cell, right, and what type of cell. So I'm actually, in case it's not obvious, super excited about the potential. I feel like we're now entering into a completely different, not will this work, can we do it? Now it's holy shit, it works, and we can do it. Now how do we make it better? And that is, is something I'm just excited, and honestly, I think we're all rooting for each other, even though others are rooting individually for us. I think that's, uh, that's all good. Maybe I'm just getting old and soft. <laughs> no, I, I feel it too. And maybe I'm the same age, but I don't know. <laughs> um, so, you know, you, you tap into something that I've, I've thought about a lot as well, which is that, and, and I don't know if it's true only for this field or for, for others, but the innovation cycle is so fast in our field. There's new CRISPR variants that can be made. There's prime editing. There's gene editing without double strand breaks. There's new cells. There's IPS developments. And yet the clinical development path is still a lot longer. Um, and so you, by the time you get to you may, maybe even your phase one or your phase two, there's like a whole new technology that could be better than what you started with. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering, maybe I'll, I'll start with Rachel since maybe this is most relevant, um, uh, or uh, one relevant. How, how do you think about that? How do you, how do you deal with that disparity in, in sort of the timeline of innovation versus the timeline of clinical development? Yeah, to, to be a bit pithy, you know, I, I think we try to avoid analysis paralysis, right? You, you want to be the perfect scientist and understand the answers to all the questions to put the perfect thing in the clinic, impossible. Um, and so really thinking through what are the questions we can ask on a meaningful timeline in an appropriate way, uh, and how do we learn from that? And how do we learn something that is not specific to that therapy, but more generic to some of these approaches that can apply across a number of disease settings? Uh, so to make it really specific, uh, for example, as we think about ways to enhance persistence, there is a future world where you could imagine a single therapy that has a number of these stitched together through a variety of different genome edits. But we felt strategically it was important to start with one at a time so that we can understand their safety, their activity, and their impact on efficacy. And that will tell us not only about the success of that potential program, but also the potential to stitch that approach in with others for future programs. And so already today, we're looking at a, a preclinical stage AML CAR-T that's off the shelf, where we're actively looking at some of the combinations of the immune cloaking with the PD-1 and other potential strategies too. So I think it has to be an evolution where you do your best to put things in the clinic that teach you not only about that program, but future strategies as well. Just real quick, there's a yep. disconnect with the macro situation that's going on, right? Which is what Rachel just described, I would sign up to, you know, all day long, we're trying to do our version of that. It just takes time, it takes patience, right? It's science doesn't happen overnight. And so this is where the investor universe and also, also have a responsibility to sort of say, listen, we need to make sure we understand and appreciate that. And that's a little dangerous right now, right? Because it is, it, it's expensive to do this and it takes a long time to do this and you gotta have room to fail. You gotta have room to learn and that, that is the part that I think wakes a lot of us up at night. Uh, hopefully the world will restore a little bit, but we need some patience with, with industry and with different players playing different roles, right? Everything from uh, the, the hospital systems to the academic systems to the startups to the bigger, medium-sized companies to the really big companies. How do we sort of do the right types of partnerships, for example, to buy you the time to be wrong a few times before you get to be really right? And uh, there's luck involved in that as well, too. But that we have to take this approach, which is a learning approach. Otherwise, it's just a set of lottery tickets. And that's, um, that's not a great way to do science. I'm not a scientist, but I suspect that's uh, probably not a very smart way to go about it. It's a really interesting point, Nick. And I, one of the things I think about a lot, too, is sort of time horizon. Like, what should we really be thinking is our time horizon for success? Um, and maybe we can just go down the line in the last minute of, what do you think the time horizon is to, or, or speculate even if you have one, how long will it take or when will you know that B cell uh, transfer has, has done the job? Uh, yes, we uh, plan to file our first IND um, before the end of next year. So it's not that far away. I'll make one comment about the cycle time. So I used to work on recombinant protein therapies. The front end of that takes a long time, even to just do an experiment, because you need to make the protein. Mm -hmm. And with cell therapy, the front end is much shorter, because just you can 
do a lot of experiments. Yeah. Uh, and so that's one reason, I think, for this disconnect between what happens in the clinic and innovation. It's a, it's a positive reason. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. How about for stem cells, IPS? Uh, I think sky is the limit, and I know not, not many people like to hear that phrase anymore. Uh, but what I have learned early on is rigor, reproducibility, and reputation adds a lot of value as we continue to think about innovation and, and the time it takes to do innovation and bring it to patient. Uh, and you know, so far we've been lucky to uh, use our you know, knowledge of smartest people we have, at the same time the backing of the investors and, and you know, blessing from the sky. You know, I think everything, it takes a huge village to raise a child like us. So. Uh, we are very positive. That's great. Um, and our time is up, so I'm going to have to skip the rest of you. I'm so sorry. It's here. <laughs> it's here. Awesome. We already started. Um, and here. 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 and maybe yeah. you can give us a, a, set, a, a five second for NK's. NK, we're, I, I think, you know, we're, we're just about there, but I think about solid tumors. And, and there we've got to start to manage our expectations, ask important questions. What's the you know, the simplest thing that we can do with the highest probability of success, do that and, and move on from there. Manage the investment and, and manage the time. Exactly. Wonderful. Thank you all for your insights and thank you for your attention. Thanks so much. Thank you.